Today we begin a new year, a new year in our church's rhythm, a pace that is different than the secular calendar, though they do line up for Easter and Christmas, which might be why so many people remember to come to church on those holidays. Our church calendar sets, marks, and saves the dates for our excitement to be rekindled throughout the year on festivals and holidays as the church seasons change. The idea is that the liturgical year helps to pull us through time to a specific rhythm. The church year helps us remember and understand ourselves and our journey of faith through hymns, prayers, and colors, while also putting us in line with God's people throughout time, people who generation after generation have heard the stories of God's love for the world in so many and various ways. Today, if we were gathered in the sanctuary, we would all witness the lighting of the first candle of the Advent wreath, that decoration of this season that counts the four weeks and helps lead us to the manger and to the glory of the Christ child who we will find there. I've been thinking a lot about the different Advent wreaths of my life this week. Those wreaths, those tools for teaching me as a child that Christmas was on its way. Those wreaths that were tools that I have used as a pastor to teach children that same lesson. What is the first Advent wreath that you remember? What color was it? What was its size, its shape? How did it smell? At Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Goldsboro, North Carolina, where I grew up, the Advent wreath was on a stand and positioned to the right of the altar. This was because the pastor, the assisting minister, and the acolyte all sat to the left of the altar. The wreath stood on its stand, safely hidden behind the partition that divided the choir loft, as to keep an unobservant acolyte from accidentally knocking it over, or worse, setting things on fire that should not be on fire. Whereas this decision made logistical sense, someone in the choir always complained that the wreath smelled too piney, or too much like yard clippings, or that it was in their way. You know what they say, there's always something. To this day, I can't look at an Advent wreath without thinking back to Good Shepherd and that sanctuary where I grew up on Mulberry Street, with the red doors, the blood-red carpet, and the adorning banners made from generation after generation that had gone to Lutheridge summer camp and returned with that always practical skill of banner making. It was in that sanctuary that I learned. I learned about the four candles of the Advent wreath, one, for each week of the season. I gravitated to that decoration because the other decoration that we made in Sunday school, the countdown made up of 25 paper rings, one for each day until you got to Christmas, seemed to me to take forever to get through and I would lose interest. But only four candles? I could get behind that. I can get behind four candles. It was in the cradle of that church family that I learned from the past, and together with all of the members of Good Shepherd, I learned to look toward the future, looking ahead and waiting for Christ's third coming. Not in a manger or in an empty tomb, but the fruition of the proclamation that Christ has died, 
Christ has risen. Christ will come again. This is the timelessness of the liturgical year, the eternal hope of faith, that in the present we learn from the past while proclaiming the joys and wonders that have yet to come. We stand here rooted in a perpetual moment, and rooted in this moment, we find our gospel reading this morning. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert. This is that third coming. In a few weeks, we will remember and celebrate Christ coming into the world in a manger. We do this, however, as we wait for him to return again. What are we to do as we wait? How are we to keep awake? How might we do this, especially in 2020, when hopelessness and isolation seem to run so rampant? Turn on the radio in your mind. To the hymns that you have sung at worship and weddings, at baptisms, at funerals. Those songs that get carved into all of our souls and help sustain our faith and our hope. Think about the songs you sang in your childhood, in whatever church you grew up in. Those melodies and words that accompany the church seasons, yet also exist outside of time. Be warmed by the memories of Advent wreaths of old that still burn bright in our mind's eyes. And consider this. Consider the Lord's Prayer. It does not live in a hymn book. It is merely printed in a hymn book. The Lord's Prayer lives in our hearts and minds. The songs, the memories, the prayers that we have learned as children and through our lives and have passed along to future generations can meet us wherever we are, whenever we need them, at sanctuary or at home, in a hospital or in a vehicle. They are all there, written on our souls, in our silent nights of wonder, in our dark nights of anguish, and in the isolated and lonely nights of our socially distant world. They have been with us since the cradles of our youth, since the first time we saw a candle lit, since the seed of the gospel took root in our souls. The truth we teach, proclaim, share, and hold is the belief in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son. And this truth is not bound to a month, a building, or a decoration. This truth is the bedrock of our souls that speaks to us from the past, in the present, and from the future. Last time I checked, the building that was Good Shepherd Lutheran Church is no longer a church. In the mid-90s, the congregation moved across town, and that was sold to build a larger building. And in the time since, it has ceased to be a church. Though the lessons that I learned there, in that sanctuary on Mulberry Street as a child, have brought me to this place of faith. The same way that the lessons you have learned, watching the wreaths that you knew, being lit one candle at a time, have brought you into this community. Year after year, Advent after Advent, the lessons we have learned in places that we cannot go to right now welcome us 
into a new church year, another cycle, another journey, another call into this rhythm and onto this path that helps direct us to the manger, to the cross, and to the throne of Jesus. Through the changing of the seasons and into this new church year, we are called into God's future while celebrating God's faithfulness throughout humanity's past. Happy New Year. Throughout the hardships and ambiguity of our world this day, I pray that this year we may be so bold to stand in the assurance of the past while moving toward the promises of the future, all the while trusting God's light to guide us. Amen.